Hi. Welcome to my channel. My name is Rainer and this is Rainier Books, where I talk mostly about books, but sometimes also about our world, its weirdness and its beauty. This video sort of developed a life of its own. I thought about presenting the shortlist of the Foils Award for Fiction in 2023, which I will do in a few minutes. But while researching about Foils, I also came to the question, who owns Foils? And these kind of questions and its answers always fascinate me and trigger me. Because often in our globalized world, a company is owned by a company who is owned by a company that is owned by another company. You know what I mean. But let's start with foils. Whenever I visited London in the last 10 years, I would take the underground to Tottenham Court Road and I would walk down Charing Cross Road and I would pay a visit to Foyle's bookshop. And I would never leave without having bought three, four or five books. William and Gilbert Foyle founded the company back in 1903. Today there are seven bookstores that bear the name of those brothers and 107 Charing Cross Road is the flagship store, once in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's largest bookstore in terms of shelf length. Like in the publishing business, where Penguin and its German owner Bertelsmann own a wide range of publishing houses with even more imprints, even the bookselling business has seen concentration and monopolization. In 2018, Britain's largest chain Waterstones bought foils, and as you might know, they have also bought Blackwells, but remained both brand names. So formally we see competition between Waterstones and Foils and Blackwells, but technically they all belong to the Waterstones empire that is run by a man called Achilles James Daunt. Daunt? Wait. Isn't there a beautiful bookshop and a publisher named Daunt Books on 81 Marylebone High Street in London, close to the tube station Baker Street? Yes! I've been there, and if you are a book lover who visits London or even lives there, you have probably been there too. This bookshop, was Don Books, was founded in 1990 by a man named James Don, and yes, it is the same man who runs Waterstones as managing director and who also runs the American bookselling chain Barnes & Noble. But a managing director is not the owner, right? That's true. Until 2018, Waterstones was owned by the Russian and Israeli citizen Alexander Leonidovich Mamut. In the 1990s, Mamut's consulting company ALM had famous Russian oligarchs such as Boris Berezovsky and Roban Abramovich among their clients. When Mamut was introduced to Daunt by uh, an acquaintance, he acquired Waterstones for $66 million and started selling books. In April 2018, Mahmoud sold Waterstones to Elliott Advisors for $250 million. Elliott kept James Daunt as CEO. So now we are in Palm Beach, Florida, where the headquarters of Elliott are situated. The American company has made investments in all kinds of branches. It held shares for Twitter, it held steamship shares, a German cosmetic corporation, Vela, football clubs like AC Milan, and about a month ago, Elliot bidded for a 30% share in the British football club Manchester United. It owns the largest holiday resort in Phoenix, Arizona, and to cut a long story short, it owns even 107 Charing Cross Road tenant foils where I buy books when visiting the city of London. And now to the price. The books Foils has a book price, both for fiction and non-fiction. And here comes, finally, the shortlist of Foils Fiction Book of the Year in 2023. Number one, Penance by Eliza Clark. It's been nearly a decade since the horrifying murder of 16-year-old Joan Wilson rocked Crow on Sea, and the events of that terrible night are now being published for the very first time. That story is penance, a dizzying feat of masterful storytelling where Eliza Clark maneuvers us through accounts from the inhabitants of this small seaside town, placing us in the capable hands of journalist Alex Z. 
Corelli Clark allows him to construct what he claims is the definitive account of the murder and what led up to it. Built on hours of interviews with witnesses and family members, painstaking historical research and most notably correspondence with the killers themselves, the result is a riveting snapshot of lives rocked by tragedy and a town left in turmoil. Turmoil, sorry. The only question is how much of it is true. The second book on the foils list is The Annual Banquet of the Grave Diggers, guilt by Matthias Ennard, translated from the French by Frank Wynne. And this book uh, is a research thesis on contemporary agrarian life, anthropology, student David Maison. He moves from Paris to La Pierre Saint Christophe, Christophe uh, a village in the marshlands of western France. Determined to capture the essence of rurality, the intrepid scholar shuttles around restlessly on his moped to interview local residents. Unbeknownst to David or David in these nondescript lands, once theaters of wars and revolutions. Death lets leads the dance. When an existence ends, the wheel of life recycles its soul and hurts its back into the world as microbe, human or wild animal. Sometimes in the past, sometimes in the future. Only once a year do death and the living observe a temporary truce during a gargantuan three-day feast where grave diggers gorge themselves on food, libations and language presided over by the village mayor. Brimming with Mathias Zenard's characteristic wit and encyclopedic brilliance, the annual banquet of the Grave Diggers Guild is a riotous novel where the edges between past and present are constantly dissolving against a Rabelaisian backdrop of excess and a paradoxically macabre paean to life's inexhaustible richness. The second title on the Foyts list, the third title, is Yellow Face by R.F. Quang. I've read this book. Athena Liu is a literary darling and Jude Hayward is literally nobody. White lies. When Athena dies in a freak accident, June steals her unpublished manuscript and publish it as her own under the ambiguous name Juniper Song. Dark humor, but as evidence threatens June's stolen success, she will discover exactly how far she will go to keep what she thinks she deserves. The book is also with deadly consequences, because what happens next is entirely everyone else's fault. With its totally immersive first-person voice, Yellow Face grapples with questions of diversity, racism, and cultural appropriation, as well as the terrifying alienation of social media. R.F. Quang's novel is timely, it is razor sharp and eminently readable, and I really, really loved it and enjoyed it a lot when I read it in the early summer of this year. The, Man the Maniac by Benjamin Labatut. Benjamin Labatut's When We Cease to Understand the World Electrified a Global Readership, a Booker Prize and National Book Award finalist in the US, and one of the New York Times 10 best books of the year, it explored the life and thought of a clutch of mathematicians and physicists who took science to strange and sometimes dangerous new realms. In The Maniac, Labatut has created a tour de force on an even grander scale, if that is even possible. A prodigy whose gifts terrified the people around him John von Neumann transformed every field he touched, inventing game theory and the first programmable computer and pioneering AI, digital life and cellular automata. Through a chorus of family members and friends and colleagues and rivals, Labatut shows us the evolution of a mind that is unmatched and of a body of work that has unmoored the world in its wake. The maniac places von Neumann at the center of a literary triptych that begins with Paul Ehrenfest, an Austrian physicist and friend of Einstein, who fell into despair when he saw science and technology become tyrannical forces. It ends a hundred years later in the showdown between the South Korean Go master Lee Sedol and the AI program AlphaGo, 
an encounter embodying the central question of von Neumann's most ambitious and unfinished project, the creation of a self-reproducing machine, an intelligence able to evolve beyond human understanding or control. This is a work of beauty and fabulous momentum. The maniac, it confronts us with the deepest questions that we face as a species. Small Worlds, a book that I love this summer by Caleb Azuma Nelson. The one thing that can solve Stephen's problems is dancing or dancing. Dancing at church with his parents and his brother. The shimmer of black hands raised in praise. He might have lost his faith, but he does believe in rhythm. Dancing with his friends somewhere in a basement with the drums about to drop while the DJ spins garage cuts. Dancing with his band, making music which speaks not just to the hardships of their lives, but the joys too. Dancing with his best friend Adeline, two stepping around the living room, crooning and grooving so close their heads might touch. Dancing alone at home to his father's records, uncovering parts of a man he has never, never truly known. Stephen has only ever known himself in song, but what becomes of him when the music fades. When his father begins to speak of shame and sacrifice, when his home is no longer his own, how will he find space for himself, a place where he can feel beautiful, a place he might feel free? Set over the course of three summers in Stephen's life from London to Ghana and back, Small Worlds is a is an exhilarating and expansive novel about the worlds we build for ourselves, the worlds we live, we dance and love within. And it's a beautiful love story again. He's really great in doing this. The Fraud by Zadie Smith. It is 1873. Mrs. Eliza Touche is the Scottish housekeeper and cousin by marriage of a once famous novelist, now in decline, William Ainsworth with whom she has lived for 30 years. Mrs. Touche is a woman of many interests. She's interested in literature, injustice, abolitionism, class, her cousin, his wives, this life and the next. But she's also skeptical. She suspects her cousin of having no talent, his successful friend, Mr. Charles Dickens, of being a bully and a moralist, and England of being a land of facades in which nothing, nothing is quite what it seems. Andrew Bogle, meanwhile, grew up enslaved on the Hope Plantation in Jamaica. He knows every lump of sugar comes at a human cost, that the rich deceive the poor, and that people are more easily manipulated than they realize. When Bogle finds himself in London, star witness in a celebrated case of imposture, he knows his future depends on telling the right story. The Tickborn trial captivates Mrs. Touche and all of England. Is Sir Roger Tickborn really who he says he is, or is he a fraud? Mrs. Touche is a woman of the world. Mr. Bogle is no fool, but in a world of hypocrisy and self-deception, deciding what is real proves a complicated task. Based on real historical events, The Fraud is a dazzling novel about truth and fiction, about Jamaica and Britain, about fraudulence and authenticity and the mystery of other people. These are the books that are on the shortlist of Foils, which is owned by Waterstones, which is owned by Elliot, who owns a bit of seemingly pretty much everything in this beautiful world. Have you read any of these books? Please drop me a comment down below. If you liked the video, slap me a like. And if you want to see more and are not part of the amazing community of my wonderful subscribers, then please consider to join us and press the subscribe button. It is for free and it doesn't hurt, I promise. So thank you guys for watching and good night from my hotel room. 218, I think it is, and the wonderful city of Malmo, Sweden, in southern Sweden. I see you soon, and have a good night's sleep, and as we say here in Sweden, Gunat. Bye-bye.